two, the identity traps. There are two identity traps. One, the belief that you should be someone other than yourself. And two, the assumption that others will do things in the way you would. These are the basic traps of which many others are variations. In the first trap, you necessarily forfeit your freedom by requiring yourself to live in a stereotyped, predetermined way that doesn't consider your own desires, feelings, and objectives. The second trap is more subtle, but just as harmful to your freedom. When you expect someone to have the same ideas, attitudes, and feelings you have, you expect him to act in ways that aren't in keeping with his nature. As a result, you'll expect and hope that people will do things they're not capable of doing. Who are you? Let's begin by recognizing what we know about you. We know you are different. You're different from everyone else in the world. Just as no two persons' fingerprints are identical, no two people are identical in terms of their knowledge, understanding, attitudes, likes, and dislikes. Your knowledge is the result of your experiences, what you've done, seen, heard, where you've been, who you've known, and what you've learned from them. No one else has lived that life and experienced all the same things. Your ways of interpreting what you see are also unique. What you consider to be logic or common sense will vary in some way from another person's logic. As a result, you see and interpret and react to what goes on around you differently from anyone else. That's not hard to see, and yet the root of the identity problem is that most people are oblivious to these differences. They assume that all people want the same things, or that they should want them. They expect everyone to respond in the same way to the same things. They assume that what one person or elite group sees and accepts should be accepted by everyone. This can range from one person expecting another to enjoy the movie he enjoys to the individual who's upset if everyone doesn't go to church. All individuals are different. Each one has his own identity, with his own knowledge, understanding, perception, and attitudes. You are in the identity trap when you overlook these differences, and that can get in the way of your freedom. You are only you. You live in a world of your own, composed of your own experiences. You can't be someone other than who you are. Consequences What else do we know about you? We know that you act in ways you think will bring particular consequences to you. You eat a sandwich because you expect it to taste good or to relieve the hunger in your stomach. You work in order to be paid money you can spend or because you enjoy the work. You turn the ignition key in your car in order to start the engine. In some cases, you carefully think out your actions. In other cases, you act from habit. You rely upon previous experiences and assume that a given action will produce the desired effect. In every case, however, you're acting in ways you think will bring you the consequences you want, and you avoid doing things you think could bring consequences you don't like. Identities As you do this, you recognize the identity of each thing you deal with. You use it in a way that's consistent with its nature. For example, a stone is called a stone because of certain characteristics that distinguish it from what we call a peanut butter sandwich. You can't eat a stone, but because of what it is, you can use it to build something. In the same way, you can't swim in a tree, but you can use a tree for shade or for firewood. To get what you want, you determine the nature of the things you must deal with. Certain things can produce certain effects, and no others. That's outside your control. 
What you do control is your choice of things that will be the appropriate means to the end you seek. A human being has characteristics that distinguish him from a stone or a tree or a sandwich. So you don't expect a human being to be a stone or anything else. And just as each stone is different from every other stone, so are human beings different from one another. You have to recognize these differences in order to be able to deal with people in ways that will bring you the consequences you want. Each person will act in keeping with his own identity. This means he will be bound by the limits of his own knowledge and experience, even if he wishes he weren't. To expect him to act otherwise is to fall into the identity trap and hope for something that can't be. You can't entrust your investments to an individual who knows nothing about money. You can't expect a knowledge of chemistry to be used by someone who's never seen a test tube. Neither can you assume that someone will do what you have decided is right. You've decided it from your unique knowledge and interpretations. He acts from his knowledge and his interpretations. You're in the identity trap when you assume an individual will react to something as you would react or as you have seen someone else react. You could make everyone else be, act, and feel in ways of your choosing if you were God, but you aren't. So it's far more useful to recognize and accept each person as he is, and then deal with him accordingly. You can't control the natures of other people, but you can control how you'll deal with them. And you can also control the extent and manner in which you'll be involved with them. The paradox is that you have tremendous control over your life, but you give up that control when you try to control others. For the only way you can control others is to recognize their natures and do what is necessary to evoke the desired reactions from those natures. Thus, your actions are controlled by the requirements involved when you attempt to control someone else. Everything you do will produce an effect or consequence of some kind. The consequences you get will depend upon the identities of the things and people and how you deal with them. To be able to foresee those consequences depends upon your ability to perceive the true identities of things and people. Truth. So the factor of truth becomes important. You want to see things truly so that you can deal with them properly. Whenever you fail to see something as it is, you will expect a result from it that's different from what will occur. Sometimes a thing turns out to be different from what you thought it was. A comparison of the first impression with later impressions can show that the earlier view was insufficient and somehow distorted. So in terms of possible later discovery, all current knowledge is incomplete or will be enlarged later. You can see this easily with regard to people you meet. Your first impression may be generally correct, but it often proves later to have been superficial or incomplete. And as a result of later knowledge, you sometimes change your ways of dealing with them. In addition, you don't have the time to discover everything that might be relevant about a given situation. You have to make assumptions, and that can lead to reading into things what you expect to find. You can be so sure something is going to be a certain way that you don't notice that it isn't. For many reasons, your perception won't always be accurate. And as you interpret what you see, your logic may not always be flawless. You might not draw all the proper connections. This means you view things subjectively, colored by your own unique perception and interpretation, and other people view things just as subjectively. Footnote. In most cases, I use words 
as they're commonly defined. In a few cases, I've redefined words to make them more explicit. Most keywords in this book will be defined as they're introduced. If you're not sure what I mean by a word, check the glossary on page 290. Not surprisingly, arguments develop over the truth of a given situation, since each person sees things in his own unique way. Very often, however, those arguments miss the point. Truth isn't an end in itself. It's always a means to an end. The purpose of knowing truth is to be able to make it work for you. You need the truth in order to deal with things as they are and get predictable results from them. The specific application for which you need the truth might be different from another person's. You may want to know the truth of a particular mechanical cause and effect relationship so you can fix your car. Another person may want that knowledge in order to build a bomb, and someone else may want it just to maintain his image as a learned person. The uses may vary, but the principle is always the same. You want the truth so you can use it to produce a consequence you want. Truth is information that leads to predictable results. So if your understanding of the truth works for you, it is true enough. So long as you're prepared for the possibility that the addition of other factors may alter the cause and effect relationship. Your ability to get what you want depends upon these considerations. How clearly you recognize the identity of each thing and person you deal with, how well you isolate the relevant factors in any cause and effect relationship, and how well you allow for the possibility that other factors might alter the relationship. Happiness. You act in ways you believe will produce the consequences you want. But why do you do that? What is it you're trying to accomplish? You may decide that your goal in life is a good marriage, fame, wealth, or any number of other things. But each of those things is only a means to a further end. For example, let's suppose you have decided you want a new car. Why do you want it? It may be that you expect to be free of the mechanical problems that bothered you with the old car. Or you may expect to receive more respect with a new car. Or you may expect driving to be more enjoyable. Whatever the reason, it's a means to a further end. You believe that getting a new car will lead to a greater feeling of well-being. You believe that you will feel better with the new car than you would without it. Of the many ways you could spend the money, you believe that getting the car will produce more mental well-being for you than any other alternative will produce. You will have to forego some other purchases to do it, but you think that those other things won't provide you the well-being that a new car would. In everything you do, with the knowledge and insight at your disposal, you choose what you think will give you the most well-being and the least mental discomfort. The objective is what is usually called happiness, the feeling of well-being. Happiness is not a new car, fame, a good marriage, wealth, or even a warm blanket. Those are things. Happiness is what you feel inside of you as a result of the things that happen to you. Happiness might be produced by a good marriage, fame, a new car, or warm blanket, but not necessarily. For some people, happiness occurs as a result of doing favors for other people. For others, it results from bringing about social reforms. For still others, it comes from believing they outsmarted someone. It might come from a big meal, sexual intercourse, music, art, dancing, singing, working, kissing, studying, gardening, resting, etc. These are things that might make an individual feel good. It's also possible for any of those things to make one feel unhappy or feel nothing at all. Whether you will be happy, unhappy, or indifferent at any given moment depends upon who you are and what happens to you. You can't simply decide to be happy and suddenly feel a gust of mental well-being. If you're not happy at any given time, it's because of what is happening to you. 
Happiness is an emotion, an involuntary reaction to what is happening to you. And unhappiness is an involuntary feeling of discomfort as you react to things that don't suit your nature. To change your mental state from unhappiness to happiness requires that you change your circumstances. And this is why you do things to bring about the circumstances that will make you happier. Everything you do is motivated by the desire to feel as much happiness as possible and to eliminate mental discomfort, either in the short term or the long term. For example, you may work hard at your career for many years because you feel it will all be worth it someday, meaning it will enable you to do the things that will make you feel good. Or perhaps the pursuit itself makes you feel better than anything else you've considered. Or you may do certain things because you are afraid that if you don't do them, you will feel bad. You may lend money to your relatives only because you would feel guilty if you didn't. Or you might go to church each week because you'd feel irreverent if you didn't. A positive decision is one in which you choose among alternatives to maximize your happiness. An example would be deciding whether you will be happier going to a movie or a football game. A negative decision is one in which you choose among alternatives to minimize your unhappiness. An example would be deciding whether to let your roof leak or to deplete your savings account to get it fixed. Neither choice will increase your happiness. You're trying to decide which choice would be the least unpleasant. A free person spends most of his time making positive decisions, choosing among attractive alternatives. Most people spend most of their time making negative decisions, deciding which alternatives would be the least unpleasant, trying to keep things from getting worse. As time passes, such a person settles for less and less, believing that it isn't possible to be free and profoundly happy. When you tell him that there are ways to break out of the pattern, all he can see is that to do so would cause more unpleasantness. There are ways to break out of such patterns, however, and many of those ways will be suggested as we proceed. Your identity. What makes you happy will depend upon your own personal nature, which is different in many ways from that of any other human being. To try to find happiness by doing what seems to make others happy is to fall headfirst into the identity trap. Others can suggest what you should do or what ought to make you happy, but they will often be wrong. You have to determine for yourself who you are, what makes you happy, what you're capable of doing, and what you want to do. Be open to suggestions, but never forfeit the power to make the final decision yourself. Only then can you act in ways that will bring you happiness. You're in the identity trap when you let others determine what's right or wrong for you, when you live by unquestioned rules that define how you should act and think. You're in the identity trap when you try to be interested in something because it's expected of you, or when you try to do the things others have said you should do, or when you try to live up to an image that others say is the only legitimate, valid image you're allowed to have. You're in the trap if you allow others to define labels and impose them upon you, such as going to PTA meetings because that's what a good parent is supposed to do, or going to visit your parents every Sunday because a good child would never do less, or giving up your career because a good wife puts her husband's career first. You're in the trap if you feign an interest in the environment to prove your civic interest or give to the poor to prove you aren't selfish, or study dull subjects to appear to be intellectual. You're in the trap if you buy a Cadillac to prove you're successful, or small foreign cars because your friends are anti-Detroit, or if you shave every day to prove you're respectable, or let your hair grow long to prove you don't conform. In any of these ways, you allow someone else to determine what you should think and be, you deny your own self when you suppress desires that aren't considered legitimate, or when you try to appear to be having fun because everyone else is, or when you settle for a certain life because you've been told 
that's all you should expect in the world. And you're in the trap when you allow others to convince you that you don't even have a right to challenge these things. When you take these various assumptions for granted, you're denying your own identity. An identity that's crying out to be expressed in ways that could bring you a great deal more happiness. No cosmic judge has declared, thou shalt be a good son, or thou shalt be a successful businessman, or thou shalt be a good wife and mother. You have chosen, perhaps carelessly, the identities you try to live up to. No one can tell you what identity you should have, but we can discuss some ways to look inside yourself to discover the identity that's naturally yours. Only then can you act consistently, purposefully, and in ways that will bring happiness to you. And every artificial identity that you cast off will bring more freedom to you. Instead of taking for granted assumptions about what you should be, start from the inside, from inside of you. Find out who you are, that unique collection of feelings, desires, perceptions, and understanding. Respect what you see in yourself. Then look at the world and decide what you can have that would ignite your nature into real happiness, and then figure out how you can make it happen. We'll discuss later some techniques of this self-exploration. If done with energy and honesty, it can be one of the most important, rewarding, and exciting tasks you can undertake. Let it all come from within you. Don't try to identify with an ideal person, a label, or a code that others think is best for you. They aren't you. They can't make your decisions for you. The identities of others. At the same time, you can waste precious time when you ignore the individual identities of other people. They aren't you. You can't expect them to be. When you misread someone's identity, you expect from him what he can't provide. You can't make a stone catch fire. Neither can you make someone be something he isn't. You're in this form of the trap if you expect your wife to act in certain ways because your mother acted that way, or when you assume someone will see the same logic you see, or if you expect an atheist to accept the principles of Christianity. It's so easy to slip into the identity trap when dealing with people. You can meet someone who has qualities you enjoy, but then find it hard to accept his drawbacks when they become evident. You wish that somehow the values could stay and the limitations disappear, and that can tempt you to try to change him so that he'll be everything you want. Unfortunately, however, you'll most likely be frustrated in the attempt. This doesn't mean that no one ever changes. People constantly change as they acquire new knowledge and discover new alternatives. But each person changes in harmony with his own nature, in keeping with his own desires for change and growth in ways that make sense to him. Recognize each person you deal with as a different, distinct, individual entity and you won't have identity problems. Try to avoid labeling individuals and then expecting them to live up to your labels. You can decide for yourself which of the people you meet have the most to offer you and then develop relationships with them based upon the values that are compatible between you. The alternative is to throw away your precious life trying to change others, to make them see what you see, to make them into what you want them to be. Each individual seeks happiness for himself in the way that his knowledge and perception indicate to him. He isn't you. Don't expect him to be. Avoiding the trap. There are four basic principles whose recognition can help avoid the identity trap. One, you are a unique individual, different from all other human beings. No one else has the exact same nature that you have. No one else reacts to things in exactly the same way you do. No one else sees the world exactly as you do. No one can dictate what your identity should be. You are the best qualified person to discover what it is. Two, each individual is acting from his own knowledge in ways he believes will bring him happiness. He acts to produce the consequences he thinks will make him feel better. Footnote, I could use up pages answering every possible exception to this principle, suicide, masochism, 
altruism, and so on. In every case, I come to the same conclusion. The individual feels that his actions will provide him more mental well-being or less mental discomfort than anything else he can think of. To test this conclusion, just ask yourself how the individual would feel if you were to interfere with his wrist slashing, getting his daily beating, or doing good works. 3. You have to treat things and people in accordance with their own identities in order to get what you want from them. You don't expect a stone to be a fish, and it's just as unrealistic to expect one person to act as someone else does. You don't control the identities of people, but you can control how you deal with them. 4. You view the world subjectively, colored by your own experience, interpretation, and limits of perception. It isn't essential that you know the final truth about everything in the world, and you don't have the resources to discover it. Instead, the test to be applied to any idea is, does it work? Does your identification of things lead to the consequences you expect? If it does, what you've perceived was true enough for that situation, but recognize the context of the situation and be skeptical when generalizing from that test to draw broader conclusions. These observations can help to keep you out of the trap. You don't have to try to live a life that isn't yours. What others say you should be is based either upon what they are or upon the way they feel you'd be of more value to them. Neither can be a valid basis for determining how you should live your life. They are doing and saying what makes them happy, and their conclusions are drawn from their own limited subjective experience. You are what you are, and it will be up to you to discover what that is. I'll help you in every way I can in this book, but the decisions will be up to you. The identity traps are the belief that you should live in a way determined by others and the assumption that others will react to things as you would. These two traps are the most basic of all traps. They might seem terribly obvious to you, if so, good, because the other traps are much less obvious and many of them are subtle variations of these two. None of them has to affect your life if you hold to the realization that you're a unique individual, a first in the world, one who will have to determine for himself what will bring him happiness. If that principle seems far removed from the problem that led you to this book, I hope to show you shortly that this is the foundation necessary to free yourself of any restriction. Until you discover and accept yourself fully, you won't have the conviction or the courage to be free.